How's that? Pretty good. Okay. Uh, but uh, anyway, as we looked at what would be a good first topic, there's a little bit, well, should we start with the existence of God? That's a good place to start. I already start with the Word of God, but I, we decided and by we, I mean me, uh, we decided that uh, we would go with the Word of God partly because I want to kind of establish that first of all because in the other lessons we will use the Word of God. Uh, so, so I thought we'd start with that. But the other thing, as I mentioned this morning, the Word of God is always going to be attacked. And this is nothing new, but it is under heavy attack right now. As to uh, should we take all the Word of God? Is that Do we believe the whole thing? Is it really God's Word? Is it really that important? Uh, many churches that you'll go to today, it's it's almost, I don't, you know, you know my, my thing isn't to attack other churches, but it is almost like we really don't want to talk about the Bible. You, you know, we, we really don't, we want to sneak some Bible truth in there, but people just don't want you standing there with the Bible. But this, but the belief that this is the Word of God, this is the foundation of what we're doing is so crucial. I thought we'd start with that. Now, a little bit different format from the standpoint of I, I definitely want to have some time for questions and answers. So if you have um, you know, something you might want to write down. There's a blank page uh, in the back that you were given that you can write a little notes on. Uh, we'll fill in some notes, uh, adding to what you've been giving on the way through. I mentioned as we go to future weeks, we'll have some different styles of teaching. Uh, I think Jim's going to do some things differently. I think some weeks we'll have some videos that are part of it. Um, today, the only video you got was that song. But um, but what we're, uh, what I want, and we're going to jump around just a little bit tonight, too, because I want to make sure that we get to some things, and then hopefully we'll have come back to finish. I felt a little bit, I mentioned this this morning, I felt a little bit like I'd be cranking open the fire hydrant and saying, uh, here, see how much you can take, because there is so much that we could dig into. So uh, you're going to hear the phrase a lot tonight, we could give you more examples. Uh, when you study and dig into some things, I want to light the fire maybe for some of you to look uh, into some things a little bit more, especially if you have some questions, especially if you are struggling with whether or not this indeed is the Word of God, uh, that we have something that we can trust here. But that is our word for tonight, trust. Uh, the T stands for three tests we're going to look at that the Scripture passes. The R stands for the fact that it is reliable. U stands for the fact that it is unique. S stands for having the signature of God, which is fulfilled prophecy. And T, the final one, stands for the testimony or truths for life that we'll go through. So we're going to go through those one at a time. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Uh, Lord, um, Spirit of God, I, I know you guide us into truth. And uh, so, therefore, we call upon you for that tonight. We, we pray, uh, Father, that your Spirit would guide us into uh, uh, understanding tonight and seeing what is true. Um, where doubts come in, uh, Lord, don't let us run. Let us uh, attack them boldly, knowing that uh, your truth can stand the test of that. So help us to dig and look for answers um, to any doubts that we might have. I pray in your name. Amen. All right, first of all, let's look at the first T. And as I mentioned, we're going to look at three tests. And almost the whole first page that I have here is devoted to the first test in here, which I think is, is a very significant idea for us to pick up here. And that is what is called the bibliographical test. Now, do you remember when you were in school, you had to do a bibliography Anybody remember what that was? That was a list of sources. Where did it come from? Okay. I don't I assume they still do bibliographies. Still do bibliographies? Okay, good. Good. And you say, and you just write down there, I just I stole this off the internet. <laughs> Everything's Wikipedia. Okay, but you still have to give your sources. Well, when looking at whether or not you can trust what are called documents of antiquity or the writings of antiquity, in other words, old stuff. Uh, they basically look for two main things. So if you would look at your, the old chart there, you see the two questions are, how many transcripts do we have? In other words, when we're compiling this information, how many different copies do we have of what was written? And then how close are those transcripts to the event? Okay, so I put that whole chart in there. With a bunch of names, I tried to, uh, actually, I combined a couple charts and tried to pick out names that everybody would be familiar with. Did I do pretty good? You, you know most of those? Aristotle, Plato, you got that. Caesar, Thucydides, maybe not. Herodotus is called the father of history, so he had to be on there. Euripides is just fun to say. Homer, you've heard of Homer? Remember the Iliad and the Odyssey? Um, 
taking you back to school here a little bit on, on some of these. And then, of course, the New Testament. But if you would look at that chart just for a couple minutes here and see what we're saying, okay, the gap, the time gap between uh, the event that is recorded and when we have the oldest manuscripts is in that second to last column. And you can see the New Testament is anywhere from 25 to 285 years with the, with the manuscripts that we have. Nothing else is really very close at all, okay? When you get into the number of manuscripts, you get into even more disparity, and you get into even more of the idea that when it comes to the Bible, you have a lot more. Now, does that prove that the Bible is the Word of God? No, please don't think I'm saying that any one of these things completely up. Oh, that's it. Question is settled. But I want to build a case, if you will. Apologetics is a word that is, uh, has its root in presenting a case. And that is very much what we want to do is present a case. And one of the main ideas that I want us to get here is that the things that you learn when you were in school, in history class, especially world history. Okay, here's what the Romans did. Here's what the Greeks did. Here's what the Babylonians did and everything like that. We trust those, right? You didn't study them and say, well, I wonder if that's really right. I wonder if Julius Caesar really did uh, invent the pizza. I don't think he did. But, uh, you know, you, you look at some of these different things that you're taught and you say, I wonder if this is really true. I, 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 don't, I don't know. No, basically, the history teacher stood up and said it, so you say, yeah, yeah, it must be true. It's all through our history books. We have it repeated over and over again. Well, what I want you to know is the writings of Scripture in a much greater way pass all the tests for historical literature. Okay, they blow the others out of the water, and, and you, you see that on that chart. We have more manuscripts. We have manuscripts closer to the date of the event. Uh, now, I'm talking primarily there, as you can see, about the New Testament. We're going to get to the Old Testament in, in a couple minutes. Uh, but, I, you know, that's very important, that bibliographical test. As we move on to the other two tests, uh, I also want to mention that uh, we're, we're going to overlap a little bit when we get to our second point. But the other two tests we call the internal tests and the external tests, okay? Back, back to review the bibliographical test, we know that we have far more manuscripts, far closer to the original. Passes that test very well. Now, when we get into the internal tests, uh, when the first one just has to do with the authorship. And in the Scriptures, uh, History, study has proven that eyewitnesses or recorders of eyewitness accounts, in other words, somebody who's listening to the eyewitness, are those who have given us, the, again, specifically the New Testament. We'll talk about something in the Old Testament in, in a second here. But b b basically, the authorship, again, blows the other historical documents out of the water, okay, as far as its accuracy. When you, uh, consistency of it. Um, you have probably heard the expression, well, the Bible is full of contradictions. You can Google biblical contradictions, and you can find some different things. I would, if you want to, go ahead and encourage you to do that, but I would also encourage you then to Google answers to biblical contradictions because they've been trying for a long time to come up. Many of them are incredibly nitpicky, and yet still there are good explanations for them. Now, this is one of the areas where I'm not going to go into... Uh, you know, okay, here's what they said, stuff like that. Most of them, like I said, are very nitpicky. They'll say, well, here it says so-and-so said this, and here it says so-and-so said this. And many times what is happening is, in the second uh, case, that person is actually lying. And if you read the whole story, uh, you'll find that they're not recording it great. But they take this verse and this one verse, plop it out of context, and say, oh, look, you have a contradiction. When you study, the, and the more that you study, you will find that the Scripture passes the test of consistency. Uh, now, this I want to talk to you about for a couple minutes and, uh, and even recommend something to you. Uh, some of you may have heard of a guy by the name of Josh McDowell. Uh, his son does a lot of work in, the, in this now. He has a book, um, it's an older book, but it's uh, still a very good work. It's just called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. But one of the things, let me say that again, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, but uh, one of the things that he goes through in there is, okay, we know that we have all these manuscripts for the New Testament. We know that they're close to the original. Eyewitnesses wrote them. Uh, they pass all these tests as far as why they could be believable, even from the just straight-out history approach, okay? However, um, 
with the Old Testament, I wrote on their Dead Sea Scrolls, some of you are familiar with that, the discovery of those and how they confirmed and verified all these records that we have. But even before that, I wrote down there this rigorous standards of the transcription. <laughs> Somebody say that word for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the process of transcribing. The process of transcribing. There we go. Uh, but what, uh, and, and this is really uh, an interesting study, and I could take the whole time and go through and elaborate on this, but the details to which the scribes had to be so careful every time they copied the scriptures is phenomenal. I'm talking about one letter at a time, not a word, because they're afraid they'd mess it up. Okay, well, I'm talking about one letter at a time. I'm talking about taking a literal hair and placing it there in between so that the spacing stayed the same. I'm talking about every time you finished a line, you had to count the number of letters in the line and the number of letters in the other line to make sure that matched up. Every time you finished a page, you had to count the number of letters on the page, the number of words on the page. Everything had to match up. They were so meticulous in the detail. You've heard of the term scribe those who transcribe, but the detail they had to give to that was phenomenal to make sure that there were no mistakes, to make sure that, that it was accurately preserved. And then the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which uh, gave us a large portion of the Old, Old Testament, uh, confirmed that you know, the, exactly that they had done it right. Okay, so the Old Testament is not exactly the same in how we look for it as far as the tests go, but still, uh, when you study the way that it was transcribed, how careful they were about every word, every detail of it, there you go, um, it is very uh, trustable, and that brings us to our second word, just the area that we're going to kind of summarize, oh, I'm sorry, got ahead of myself, the external test then, Again, just to kind of combine these for a second, as far as things outside of the Bible confirming it, the literature of that time, when you read it, it corresponds. There's no contradiction to Scripture in the events of that time, in the details of that time. Archaeology uh, of the time, I think that might be spelled wrong in your book. I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, the archaeology is confirmed, never convicted. Uh, contradicted. So every time that they find a new dig, they find a new you know, site of whatever like that, hey, wait a minute, this is exactly how the Bible said it was. There are some things that have not been discovered yet, but each time they do, there's nothing that says the Bible couldn't have taken place. It all has taken place. Uh, so uh, so the, it passes those three tests. Now again, that made my case, I'm done. No, I'm not saying that at all. I, I am just saying, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, you can either, you can, you can either be factual and intellectual and reasonable, or you can be spiritual. And that makes me so ticked uh, because, again, if I'm going to believe everything that I learned and studied about uh, Julius Caesar, then I'm going to have to take a little faith in the whole process. Well, when I think about that process that they took to gather that information, the Bible exceeds the thoroughness of that by far. So if I can trust the things I learned in history class, I can dead sure trust the things that I read in the Word of God, okay? That's kind of point number one. You're welcome to, you know, throw something or yell at me any time in the middle, or we will have a question time at the end if you want to just jot it down and save it. So uh, the R that we have is reliable. So the first thing is, is passing these tests reliable, and we are going to overlap just a little bit with this. But historically, when you look at different things uh, in Scripture, they are going to match up. They're going to fit with history, what we know to, to be historical. I wrote down the word Hittites there, kind of a weird thing. Uh, my brother, which I guess my brother's a little interesting fellow too now that I think about it, but uh, he used to tell Hittite jokes. Back in the days before political correctness, uh, he told Hittite jokes because there are no Hittites. Anybody know any Hittites? Uh, I don't know any Hittites. So he would say, you know, how many Hittites does it take to screw in a light bulb? You know, that type of thing. Um, it, you know, there was never a Pollock joke because that could offend the Pollocks. There was never anything like that. You, you would just tell Hittite jokes, all right, because there are no Hittites, right? And uh, the, the Bible talking about Hittites was a big sticking point for people for a long time. They were like, eh, there are no Hittites. They've never been, you know, proven historically, and yet the Bible talks about them all the time. So it was about... 
42 years ago, I think, and I looked it up. The Hittites were, yes, they were. They were proven in history. They were found in history. And these things have happened and happened and happened down through time where for a while they'll say, well, the Bible talks about this and we have no record of it. And then history gets a little smarter, gets a new dig, uh, finds some new things. And they oh, yeah, well, wait a minute, yeah. And every time there's a new discovery, it does more to verify Scripture than to take away from it. It, it is reliably history. Historically, and definitely also geographically. Just when you look at everything about the, uh, the, the uh, terrain of different areas that it describes, when you look at the location of different countries, uh, you can go back to the, the maps that were drawn in that time that fit perfectly with the Bible's description of what was going on there. Uh, so historically, geographically, and scientifically. And I want to jump up and down on this point here again. Uh, the Bible is not anti-science. It's not you make a decision as to whether or not I'm going to be scientific or I'm going to be biblical. Um, the Bible, you know, we get this idea where the Bible and evolution contradict. Evolutionary science does not contradict the Bible. Evolutionary theory does. And I want to say that over and over again. You say, well, that's what I believe. And, wh and many times we've been taught that over and over, over again. But it is still theory. Okay, and you press press on it. It's still theory. Yeah, no, we haven't found that link. No, we don't have any proof that there's a crossover, you know, between uh, you know, the reptiles. And the, but, you know, we believe that this is, you know, we, we, we think so. You say, well, didn't there, you know, and, and I think Jason's going to get into this some more in the evening that he teaches. But, uh, you know, when you talk, yes, there is a development of, say, for example, different kinds of dogs. Uh, yes, there is a, you know, you see different things like that. You see some crossbreeding and, and different things like that. But this jump in species and this evolution from, uh, that would lead us from an animal to a human is not science. Okay, it's theory. Okay, that, that's the theory that they have. But they want it, they don't come back. I wrote on there the phrase hung on nothing. By the way, uh, do you know if the word is, if you, the past tense of hang, is it hung or hanged? It is either. Did you know that? Isn't that weird? I looked that up because I thought hung, that doesn't sound right. Uh, but then you can go with either. So I was going to do two different copies. Just uh, uh, get excited. But the reason why I wrote that phrase on there, there are many uh, cases where down through history, the scientific world has made this statement about the world. For example, the flat earth. Okay. Um, at Columbus's time, not everybody believed the earth was flat. Some still did. You know, you heard that story about how he was like, ah, the world, she's a round. No, the world, she's a flat. Uh, and they had that. I'm sorry, that was a, that was a uh, Bugs Bunny uh, cartoon, but it was pretty good. Uh, but, the, uh, but not everybody forever has believed the world was flat. However, there was a time when they did. Okay? And God had said from the very beginning, he called the earth a sphere. Okay? I put hung on nothing because, again, you've probably seen this in ancient, the way they used to teach the different things that would hold up the uh, earth. Have you seen the you know, pictures? Maybe it's Atlas, maybe standing on a turtle, standing on this and everything like that, and that's how the earth. And God said from the very beginning, no, he, God hung it on nothing. Okay, that, that, that's where it is. And you find the Bible is ahead of its game as far as these areas are concerned. Okay? I got the fire hydrant open. I've been talking really fast here. But we got, uh, okay, we've got the test that it passed. We have that it is reliable. Are you ready for the you? It is unique, which leads me to one of the worst jokes that I'll ever tell. How do you catch a unique rabbit? Unique up on them. That's right. Um, I had to do it. I'm sorry. I just had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> my wife reminded me how bad my joke bombed this morning. And uh, I'm blaming John Ferguson. He told that to me the week before. Of course, I didn't have to repeat it. Okay, now we're, we're definitely going to have a little, little mistake here in our spelling. But uh, let, let's go through here. And again, I'm not saying that these things by themselves prove that the, word of, the Bible is the Word of God. But we're building a case. And the Bible most definitely is very, kids are, I'm not sure where, but if the guys want to stay in here, that's great too. Um, uh, Circulation, top seller every year. Okay, now, here's what we're saying about that. I'm not saying that the Bible is the top seller all time. I'm saying that every year the Bible is the top seller. Okay? You say, well, it's not on the list. Well, that's because it's almost like it's just assumed it's going to be the top seller every year. I had somebody one time in a session argue with me and say, now, wait a minute. Harry po I heard that Harry, one of the Harry Potter stories outsold it one year. Um, 
I, I could not find any verification of that, and I did look for it. But even if it did, then I would I will be willing to amend it and say the Bible's been the top seller every year but one year when Harry, one of the Harry Potter stories beat it. Uh, but uh, I doubt I doubt that is true, but it's possible. Um, but that the circulation of the Bible is phenomenal. Okay, every year, uh, it is it is the world's best top seller. The continuity of Scripture is incredible in that it has over forty authors written over 1,500 years in three different languages, and again, you get this no contradictions, okay, that, that can be found. When you put that all together, that it is designed and, and put together uh, by God in that way, and then survival, that might not be spelled right, but I really wanted to stay with C's. Um, just as the Bible has more copies in existence, it also has been attacked more than any other book, destroyed, burned, uh, let's do everything we can to snuff out the Word of God, make sure that it is not allowed. And yet, the Bible goes on. Yet, it continues, despite all the efforts to destroy it. So, it is unique in those three elements. Okay, so we got uh, three tests. We got the uh, reliability. We got the uniqueness. And uh, the S we have is the signature of God. Oftentimes, fulfilled prophecy is uh, called the signature of God. Some of you may remember, I kind of hope so, but it might be just a, a pipe dream. But uh, we, we went back, uh, a while back, we went through the book of Daniel. And Daniel is, is one of the most prophetic books, um, Old Testament-wise. But Daniel is interesting because it talks about the world kingdoms that are going to come. You know, and it, it predicts that uh, there will be, you know, this kingdom replaced by this kingdom replaced by this kingdom by this kingdom. And when you study the prophecies, it is so clear that what you have is Assyria being replaced by Babylon, being replaced by the Medes and the Persians, being replaced by the Greeks, being replaced by the Romans. It is so crystal clear, and it was all before any of that happened. Okay, but it's laid out uh, perfectly, and there are countless examples of that kind of prophecy in the book of Daniel, in the book of Isaiah, uh, throughout the Old Testament, and then also throughout the New Testament. I wanted to pass this out to you, just if, if you want it, uh, so, so you'd have it. I'll, uh, I think I have plenty of that. I'll just send a glob of them across there. Uh, but most significantly, I think, are the Old Testament prophecies about the Lord Himself. So this is just, you can just kind of add this to your notes. Uh, I want forgive me for the fact that they are, they have some doodles on them. Um, quite frankly, I did not have time to type up the whole thing again, so I just made copies, and those are some doodles that I put on there sometime. Why I didn't put that in your hand since you were right there? I have no idea. Uh, but it just does give you an example of some of the prophecies that were are fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to go back and look at that later. Uh, you, have, you may have, I don't know if you've heard of any of the, you know, just the chances of one individual fulfilling all these prophecies. Um, they, you know, they, they do these, statisticians do these goofy little things about, you know, if you took uh, silver dollars and you filled them a foot high in the entire state of Texas and you painted one red, okay, the state of Texas, a foot high with silver dollars, one of them is red, and you randomly chose a silver dollar. The odds of you choosing that red silver dollar are better than the fact that one person could fulfill all these prophecies. Now, they have all these different things like that. I don't get too thrilled about them all, all the time, but I think they're kind of interesting. But the idea is just the, uh, that God uh, told us very clearly throughout Scripture. We looked at that this morning. As soon as the curse is pronounced, the promise of the Savior. Okay, and throughout the Old Testament, and one of the things that I have really enjoyed, I may come back to this in a minute, about this devotional book that we've been doing this year, is that it's called Jesus Day by Day, and each day it helps us to see that the entire Scripture is pointing to Jesus, because a lot of times we miss that. Oh, there's a different God in the Old Testament, and, uh, and, and for some people it's like, ah, oh, we need to set the Old Testament aside. The term that is used sometimes today is unhinge. We need to unhinge the Old Testament. It's not that important. But, uh, but I, don't, I don't want us to do that in any way. And we can see through the signature of God uh, in fulfilled prophecy. Now, the last of the five letters that we have there, that last T, um, I wrote in your notes there, truths for lives or testimony. And let, let me go through truths for lives for a second here and then just uh, kind of tell you something that I'm thinking about this as, as I teach this, uh, when I say truth for lives, I'm talking about things like just the general wisdom of life, 
okay? A soft answer turns away wrath. You know, that, that type of idea, how to communicate with people. Uh, character issues as far as hard work, as far as honesty, you know, that, that type of things that the Bible promotes. Um, things like, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a verse in the Bible about he that uh, gets involved in something that doesn't uh, concern him. It's like he that takes the dog by the ears. Basically, mind your own stinking business, um, you know, would be the paraphrase of that. And I love just the practicality of that. I love the, the lessons of Scripture that teach us how about relationships. That's something we get to look at next week when we talk about God's institution of the, of the family, but how, you know, his plan is. To, so in other words, when I say truth for lives, bo- bottom line is I want to say the Bible works. OK, following its principles and precepts work. OK, God's all wise. He's going to get, give us these things. When we, and I think sometimes, honestly, you can take one principle of Scripture, it can transform your life. I started to live by this principle. I mean, think about it as somebody with a, a terrible temper who just learns uh, that a soft answer turns away wrath, and he just says, the first thing I'm going to do is say a kind word back to somebody who's mad at me. It, transform, it can tra- transform a marriage, transform a home, you know, that type of thing. So I think all those things are powerful. But when I look at this last point, I feel compelled to say this. This is either my strongest point or my weakest. For me, this is my strongest point. I love to look at the fact that the Bible can be proven historically, and if you want to say it like that, and that it is reliable in these different areas. I love that. However, however, the thing that I love most, and uh, say this, and for some people this is going to mean nothing. I realize that, but I love the difference that it has made in my life. Okay. I, I love that. I love that the Word of God has been alive and powerful in my life. I was mentioning this morning, and again, it's not like I think the Bible's like magic. Oh, I read it, and everything's wonderful, everything like that. But it shows up in my life when I've strayed away from a regular time in God's Word. It does. You want amen? My wife? My wife could amen? Yeah. Uh, I've seen it uh, over and over again. But, but I know that is true. I know that that shows up in, in, in my life. The Bible, me being in the Word of God, uh, strengthens my faith. And, and I, I try to be as transparent as I can when, when I teach about things. I mean, yes, I read things sometimes, and I think, I didn't get that. I didn't, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second here. I didn't completely understand that one. But still, just the difference that the Word of God has made in my life. Now, if you don't believe that, you know, that's the weakest point, I guess. You know, you know if, it, if it really has not impacted your life, I guess that's the weakest point. I don't, I don't know what else to say. But for me, and there's a degree to all of this where I think we have to say we are going through a class on apologetics. Uh, Jim's going to take next week and talk about the idea that we have great evidence that there is a God. And uh, I have great confidence that he's going to do a wonderful job of putting together a case for the fact that there is a God that exists and help us know how to present that case and understand that case. However, Jim is not going to completely prove there's a God unless he's going to bring him in here and say, yeah, shake his hand, you know, like that. He's not going to completely prove it. So in each case, uh, so this is the phrase that I'm going to come back to. We have Good reason to believe what we believe, but we have a faith. We have what I believe is a very reasonable faith. There is good logic behind our faith, but it is a faith, okay? And, uh, you know, others are going to decide to put their faith maybe in something else, in some teachings of men. But, I, you know, I, I don't want to pretend like, well, I, okay, I've just proven to you that the Bible's unquestionably the Word of God. I believe that. Uh, strong in that, and I think when you combine that all, we can see that. Now, the next page of your notes uh, gets into uh, a little bit of how the Bible was actually put together, how it was compiled. I'm going to skip that for a second because I want to make sure I give adequate time to something else because I want to make sure we took a little bit of time tonight just to be very practical. Uh, I think we'll, we'll come back to that. But you have a blank page at the end if you want to use that for this. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit and maybe get us together to talk about what will help us get into, get anchored in the Word of God, what has been helpful to you, you know, so that we can be a help to each other. So I was just going to take a minute and uh, outline the, the Bible as a whole for a second. The, uh, the Old Testament, you, you may be familiar, is 39 chapters. The first five we call the Pentateuch or the Book of Moses or the Books of the Law, okay? Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deut- Deuteronomy. The next 12 are 
we call them the historical books or the books of history, which go through from Joshua, Judges, Ruth, goes through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, and Esther. I missed something in there. Maybe I didn't say Ruth. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, there are 12 in there, and that is very much a history. It lays out the history of God's working uh, in the lives of, of the nation of Israel in particular and God bringing about uh, eventually the place of bringing the Savior. Now, the other three sections in the Old Testament, the books of poetry, which are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, and then the major prophets, are, which are there are five of them, and then 12 minor prophets. The five major prophets are not called that because they're significant, more significant. They are called that because they're, they wrote longer books, okay? Uh, and the one that sneaks in there is the book of Lamentations, which, because it was written by one of the other guys, Jeremiah, okay? So Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, and Lamentations are the five major ones. Then you get into all those other ones that if I try to list in order, I'll mess up. You got Obadiah and Zechariah and Zephaniah and Malachi. Wait, Malachi, Malachi, however you want to say it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, okay, so you have this framework in the Old Testament that is the history. The Bible is not in chronological order. So these other writings, these poetical books, fit back into the story that goes through the history. Okay, David wrote a lot of the Psalms while he wrote them during the things that were going on in largely in like 2 Samuel, different things going on there. And sometimes when you're studying it, you get to read, hey, here's what David was going through when he wrote it. In fact, they've even put together a study tool called the Chronological Bible where, uh, you know, as you read through the story, then you, you can read the Psalms that, that are written there at that same time and go through that. But so that's how the Old Testament is set up. First of all, you have, uh, you know, the book of beginnings in Genesis and you have these five books written by Moses, the history, and then the prophetic books and the poetry and wisdom that work back into the history. The New Testament, kind of similar because the Old Testament starts with your foundational books there. The New Testament has your four Gospels, the life of Christ. And then it has one book of history, kind of a long book, which is called the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And this is the story of the beginning of the church, okay? Uh, not the story of Israel, but the story of the church here in the New Testament. And the, then you have the next couple sections that fit back into that story. Again, they're not in chronological order. You have 13 letters written by Paul, 13 or 14, depending on if Hebrews was. And then you have what are called the general epistles, which is when you get into Peter and, and James and John and Jude. And uh, most people put Hebrews in there, too. Those are called the general epistles. Okay, so those epistles, again, not in chronological Chronicle, uh, that word, uh, scratch that from the tape, but uh, not in chronological order, but they are, but they would work back into the story of Acts. Uh, and, uh, and again, a lot of times it's helpful to study where this fit into the story. Okay, Paul wrote this when he, you know, why is he writing back to Corinth? Well, he had left Corinth and here's what happened in Corinth after he left, that type of thing. So, and then you have uh, one book of prophecy, which is in the New Testament, which is? Say it again. Thank you. That's always been a pet peeve of mine. I don't know why, but when you put an S on there, Meyer is Meyer, not Myers. Okay, just to clarify. Uh, why that bothers me, I have no idea, but Revelations bother me too. It's, it's Revel, the book of the Revelation. Uh, it is Christ. Okay, now, um, I wanted to kind of put that outline of the Scripture up there, and like I said, one of the things I wanted to make sure that I, I made time to do tonight is talk just a little bit about what would be helpful for us. I'm going to be real honest. We have, I don't know what we got in here, 30, 35 people. I, I don't know what we have. You guys are probably, so to speak, I'm not trying to give you a big head, but you're the cream of the crop as far as you're interested enough to come tonight. Do you, do you know what I mean? Or, and if you're listening at home, <laughs> you are special. Uh, forgot about you. Uh, you are really special too. Okay. But what I mean is you guys are probably the, those who are most likely to do more than just have this sitting on a table somewhere. You are most likely to be the ones that actually spend time in the Word of God. And I'm not going to take a survey tonight. I'm not even by hand or in, anything like that. But I, will, I would bet a lot my 
$20,000 prize. Uh, but I, I would bet a lot that many of you, and I'm, I'm not saying this to be insulting, uh, but many of you also really struggle with staying in the Word of God. That you go days and, and, uh, and, and then you've had times, and this is my story, that's why I say it. You've had times when I'm going to jump in and, and here I go, bambo, and then, well, the first day I'm on fire. Second day I'm on fire. Third day I skipped that, but I'll catch up. Third day, made it, uh, and then we'll go five or six days. And, you know, again, we're talking about a 45-year period of time in my life, but I've had a ton of runs like that where, where I, you know, get excited, and here I go, and then I fall away. I believe and this is, I guess, a theory, but I believe that this is so important that the devil does everything he can to keep us away from this. I really do. Uh, I, it just attacks it like crazy. And, and one of the, that's one of the reasons, and you've heard me say this a lot if you've been around here, when you mess up, in other words, you decide you're going to have a, a, a time with the Lord and you mess up, he is going to tell you this. Why try again? You've been going to do this before. Give it up. God's so sick of hearing your promises, just give it up. And I just want to say, get back on the horse, <laughs> okay? Because that's what I finally learned to do, okay? Rather than sit there, beat up myself, ah, oh, stink, I've read my Bible now for three days. You know, I just did it, and I'm the stinking pastor. Uh, you, know, you think I've, you know, and don't, don't allow that to happen. Uh, you know, determined to say, hey, I'm going to make this part. Now, let, let me ask you a couple questions and that get you thinking about both of these. If you were, I, I want to know what are some of your favorite passages to read. In other words, like, hey, this, this is something, uh, or books, just, I really like this. And maybe you can give a reason, maybe you just want to say the name, name of the book. And then I guess I also want to know if you have found any tools or strategies that have really helped you. Now, I have been mentioning the one we've been using around here. I have really liked this uh, through the yearbook, this Jesus every day. I've been having a real good time with that. We are actually out of them now. They can be ordered on Amazon. Jesus day by day, it's called, and that has been very, very helpful to me. In fact, I'm I know that 2023, I'm going to go through it again, because I mentioned it had been a long time since I'd read through a lot of the passages of Scripture, and I want to I want to read through the Bible each year. So uh, I'm going to use that again. But Sometimes you connect differently, to be real honest with you. You know, I'll say, hey, Meg, you got to read this book. It's changed your life. And she's like, oh, maybe he needed his life changed more than I did uh, because it's no good. So, so I want to know, you know a couple different things. Do you have a favorite book of the Bible that you love? Or do you have a plan or a, something that has helped you stay in the Word of God? Yes, ma'am. Sounds like winter. All of us need to run every morning and read our, uh, and get, get on a bike. No, that is, that is, <laughs> no, me smartly. <laughs> she says she'll do it when I do it, I think. Uh, but, you know, no, that's great. I mean, you get in a routine. And I actually preached on that a while back, this idea you really can't separate that out. I mean, the, the discipline in one area of your life carries over to the other. That's great. What else we got? Favorite book? Colossians, okay. Romans. Romans. Job. 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 Somebody say Job. Ephesians and Jude. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, Ephesians uh, and Colossians and, and Philippians, yeah, those are just loaded. They're usually about four or six chapters each. Let's go to, did you say Jude? Can you tell me, can you know why you love it? Jack, I love that. Um, it just reminds me of what's happening now. Okay. Uh, the reason I asked is so, sometimes those little books, Jude and Second and Third John, get a little lost. Like, what are they about? So that's 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 really cool to, that 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 has become a, a special book. Now, Job um, is fits in the category of poetry because it's these long speeches that these guys give. But you know, again, you get to the c conclusion, and bottom line is, oh, you're God, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I love the journey Job went on there. I mean, there's part of me that hates it, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, but uh, mentally just to watch the journey that he goes through and finally God says, okay. Uh, well, I mean, his faith was just impeccable. And I think that's what I, I really love about it is that I wish I could be like that. Yeah. In, in the difficulties. Yeah. 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 Quit. 
time like that. Well, let's stay on that for a second. Anybody else have a particular favorite book of the Bible? Genesis. Genesis? Okay. Isaiah. I like Isaiah. Isaiah, in the Old Testament, a lot of people uh, like that, the prophecy of that. Yeah, there are some books that if Bible reading is somewhat new to you, you want to jump into the Old Testament, um, I think that Genesis and Isaiah and Psalms and Proverbs are probably good launching points. Um, uh, Ecclesiastes is pretty good too. Song of Solomon, uh, I wouldn't start there unless, <laughs> just, just saying, uh, I wouldn't start with that one. Uh, and in the New Testament, some of these ones they mentioned, uh, these shorter epistles that are four or six chapters are usually, uh, you know, you just look and what Paul will do is he'll write and explain some doctrine at the beginning and then he'll kind of say, now here's what that looks like in life. Here's how we live because of that. And that's Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, um, Galatians. Uh, you know, those books will kind of do, do that. So anybody else before we leave that? Matthew. Matthew, okay, read, just reading the Gospels. Uh, good idea. Uh, definitely a good idea to, to make a regular time to read through the Gospels. Uh, which Gospel is usually considered to be the easiest read? John. John, so good, good place to start there. And by the way, I am not talking down to you when I say that. <laughs> you want the easy one. Uh, because... I've said this, honestly, there are times when I just look and I say, I need something easy to read. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I like Philippians. I think Philippians is an easy read. I'm, I'm reading Philippians today because yesterday I was struggling a little bit. Uh, so anyway, okay. I was going to say a study Bible is really nice, too, because you are reading something that you don't understand. It's nice to go to those notes. Okay. Help you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, you can get a study Bible for anywhere from $25 a hardback copy or whatever like that to paying, you know, a hundred and some dollars, depending on the binding and everything that you want. Um, I use the ESV Bible here in preaching, and there's just a Bible that's called the ESV Study Bible, and it is helpful when you have some questions. You know, look down, what is that about? You know, many times the answer is there. Now, I'm going to tell you something else, and, and uh, Chris, Chris might not even like this. You can edit it from the tape if you like that I do. Because, and this might rub you the wrong way, but I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you for a second. Uh, this is what I do. I, there are paraphrases of the Scriptures that are out that I do not regard. Uh, okay, a translation means they look at the original language and, uh, and study it in detail and try to be you know, super accurate. A paraphrase is more likely to be they read what's there and tried to put it in common language. Okay, I think the translations are much more accurate. So I don't, on a regular basis, read from a paraphrase. How I, and the reason I'm saying it somewhat apologetically, some people are kind of like, ah, oh, those paraphrases of the devil. Okay, if you feel that way, I'm not going to argue with you. But I want to tell you what I do. I have a paraphrase. And a lot of times when I'm struggling with something, in fact, I pulled out this week when I was going through something in Ecclesiastes because I thought, I'm not sure. I don't take it as the original language or anything like that, but a lot of times I say, hey, this, this person, here's how they understood it. And sometimes I'll read it and I think, oh, yeah. That's what they're saying. It, it just makes sense. It's just in a more common language that sometimes is, is easy to interpret. Now, if that uh, rubs you the wrong way, just scratch that out, and you can tell me about it later and throw some ice cream at me or something like that. Uh, that's okay. But I, and I, we use, uh, for instance, I have the message at home that we look at, which is a common one, a uh, more recent one. Again, I don't hold it up and say, best translation ever. But it has helped a lot of times just to, to read through and, and get an understanding. So that's what that we have, we have done. Anything else as far as, uh, I'm going to say, techniques, methods, time of the day, books that have, have helped you dig into Scripture on a regular basis? Yes, sir. When I was just getting started, I did a lot of daily emails. So that, you know, I check my email every day. So one of the things that I was reading was daily Scripture that came in my email inbox. Okay. So for a time, that was very helpful <coughs> Okay, You're, there are different apps that will send you that. Uh, Uversion is one. I was actually on uh, BibleGateway.com. BibleGateway.com. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Dave sends me devotionals every day. Um, that, that's just very, very helpful. Sounds like a good idea. Maybe maybe there is a partner that uh, you know, gets to send the verse, uh, verse to you like that. Sounds like a good plan. Yes, sir. Rather than the volume of chapters I read, I try to understand everything that I read. Something. To, to, uh, yeah. to a decent degree. Uh -huh. yeah. So you don't think God's going to give you bonus points for a number of verses you've read when you get to heaven? I don't think so. 
<laughs> but but you'll take them, right? Uh, if, if that's how it goes. Yeah, no, right. That that's that's good. You know, just a lot of times, just reading until there is something that's like, okay, I understand this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I use YouTube, but there it's called the Bible Project, and they give you an overview of a book. Okay. And I think they do a pretty good job, so you can understand the layout of a particular book. Okay. You know, and if there are different apps that'll play the scripture for you, but you can just YouTube, um, you know, reading Exodus in whatever translation, ESV, KJV, whatever you want to use, and there it is. I mean, you know, we've done that a couple times in the car where, you know, we, we can't just stop and read it, and, and you know, maybe, maybe that would be a something, too, you know, on the way into work. Uh, just listen to it. It really is, you know, to take time for even a chapter of the Word of God a day, and even in detail, is really not overwhelming. But like I said, I think we face amazing opposition there. I think, I think, I think there's a great attack on the Word of God and keeping it out of our lives. So, okay. All right, I do want, what do we got? We got about 10 minutes. Okay, I do want to run uh, and hit a little bit just about as far as how Scripture is put together. Before I do that, though, um, any, any just, you know, really even maybe over something we said or, or any other questions that you have you wanted to make sure you ask because I don't want to cut you off at the end. Okay. All right. I think uh, this is not, um, I know I was a teacher for a long time, this is not a great strength of mine is uh, involving a, a crowd. I have a tendency to talk a lot. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But, uh, but I, I think as we get into some of the other teachers, they'll do a better job with I involving everybody because, uh, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a gifted small group leader for that reason, too. I have a tendency to talk just a tad too much. All right, so I'll keep talking. Okay, you ready? Let, let's go back uh, to the, that uh, page that we, or third page that we have there. Um, just in case you wondered or curious as far as how, was, how do we have the books that we have, how was it compiled? The term that is used for both the collection of the Old Testament and the collection of the New Testament is canon. Uh, the word actually comes from a word that means read or measuring stick. Uh, one of the main ideas that we want to remember is the Word of God was not chosen, it was received. And uh, groups of men who had studied and, and researchers got together and, uh, and said, you know, hey, what should be the criteria that we take for accepting these words? Now, you know, I put down the dates. Uh, the Old Testament canon actually was established before that, but it was confirmed there in A.D. 70. The New Testament canon in 393. I wanted to mention, too, because some of you may have heard of something called the Council of Trent. And some people think that's when the scripture was established. The Council of Trent, if you have ever heard of that, was when actually the Protestants and the Catholics split. Okay? And largely it was over what books were involved in the canon. And I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. The, uh, the Catholic Bible has a section of books that are called the Apocrypha that, that you would find between the Old and the New Testament. And, you know, sometimes people, you know, I'll say you're in a conversation with somebody and they talk about a place called purgatory. Are you familiar with, with that term? Uh, and you say, well, wh where's that in the Bible? Well, you won't find it if you have a 66 uh, book Bible. But if you had the Apocrypha, you would. And there are a couple other things like that that you say, okay, where did the Catholic Church get this? That's not in the Bible. And you say, oh, yeah, it is. It is in their Bible, uh, if you want to say it like that in the, in the Council of Trent. So they have some extra books. But... But anyway, uh, so there were groups of uh, scholars, if you want to say, that got together in, in a collection of this. And uh, that, that next little list that I have there is just some of, some of the criteria that they looked for as far as uh, should we accept this. Um, especially talking about the, uh, the New Testament. Apostolic, uh, was it written by one of the apostles, somebody who was a first-hand witness of Jesus or somebody who was a first-hand witness to somebody who was a first-hand witness. In other words, either somebody that actually was with Jesus or somebody that recorded somebody else. There are some books in the, um, in the New Testament that were uh, transcribed from somebody else. Um, you know, somebody dictated it to them for somebody. 
But uh, and were there other letters and stuff during this time? Yes, most definitely. Uh, we know for a fact, for example, that Paul wrote four letters to the church at Corinth. We have two of them in Scripture. Well, you know, how did they decide which were part of that canon and which were not? This is some of the criteria. Uh, authentic, written by those who claimed to. That was an important thing they looked for. Was it accepted by the early church as the Word of God? In other words, did they look at this and say, hey, this is, you know, God, this is something that God has given us, a message there. Agreement, and this is crucial with the rest of Scripture. Make sure that there is not where it would say something different. And then acknowledgement, was it quoted or referred to by something else in Scripture? Now, this is especially true where we see the Lord give acknowledgement to things in the Old Testament, uh, but also and the New Testament giving acknowledgement to the Old Testament and back, back and forth like, like, the, like that. But again, it, we're looking for this idea of everything going together. Uh, the Bible, um, I, I was going to say one of the most attacked books of the Bible, as far as some people say, why is it in there, is a book called the book of Esther. I think Chris preached last year. He preached from the book of Esther. Uh, does anybody know, first of all, why the book of Esther is attacked so much? God is not mentioned in there. The word God is not in there. And they're like, you know, why is this there? But when you read and you study the story, and Chris probably brought this out very well, it is a beautiful story of God's preservation, first of all, of the line of Christ, of his people, and how, and how good God did that, you know, in, in everything. And you watch God work very clearly, even though his name is not mentioned, but for that reason, it did get criticized. Um, there are... As, as I mentioned, and if you have ever read, uh, Jude caught my attention because Jude sometimes falls into that category. People are like, okay, that's a short little thing. What did that say? Um, there's, a, there's a book uh, in the middle of the, of the epistles called Philemon, and it's just one chapter, and it's, it's basically one guy writes, and he says, hey, you've got to forgive this guy. <laughs> uh, let him back. He's helpful to me. I know he's a pain to you before, but let him back. And, uh, and second and third John are also just very, like, personal letters about specific situations. Uh, one really stresses a hospitality idea and focuses on things like that. And, you know, again, sometimes it takes a little digging to find out exactly. But, you know, this is why I like to say the Bible, I, I see it as... Uh, you know, again, the layer thing, I like to say, because you look and there are some things I just read and I think, well, that is just as clear as could be. You know, I just read that. Bam, there it is. You know, a lot of times I'm reading through Proverbs. I'm like, well, that was easy um, like that. And then sometimes I'll read something and just think, OK, I know I've read that before, but I don't even remember reading that before. And what, you know, and Francis, I was it last week we were going through Song of Solomon and uh, and you know, sometimes you're like, okay, uh, okay, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Not sure exa exactly why. You know, you get in the book of Leviticus, you read some laws about rabbits and uh, which rabbits you can eat and kill and stone and everything like that. And it's like, okay, why, why is this all in here? And sometimes you really have to dig to find out what God is communicating there, and we need some help with that. Uh, and some of it is, is crystal clear. And again, I don't, I, I don't want to oversimplify. I am not, you know going to rub this magically on Megan's head and change her life. It's magic uh, like that. But, uh, but the testimony of my life is just as plain as could be, and that is when I stray away from this, when this is not the anchor. Now, I have had in my life what I call uh, li uh, lifelines, like if you're working window cleaning, you have these safety or you're, uh, what's it, zip lining? You know, you have the 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 clips on and, and hold on to. I've had those my whole life. So uh, uh, Dave, Dave remembers, you know, I was back Christian school teacher and yeah, I had to be a good boy. I couldn't go out and do crazy things. You know, I'm going to lose my job and my wife and, uh, and everything. So I had these lifelines, but at the same time, spiritually, a lot of times I was empty. Okay. And in every one of those cases, every one of those cases, this was missing. Okay, I'd wandered away from, from spending time with God and His Word. And in every case, you know, bringing back, uh, you know, is when I, when I dive back in. And sometimes it took a little work. Sometimes it took a little, little challenge. But uh, I cannot, you know, be emphatic, uh, jump up and down enough and just say, man, we need the Word of God. And it's not going to work the same for everybody. Some of you, you're going to love to get up. First thing you do is open it in the morning. Some of you, if you did that, you wouldn't have a clue what you're reading. And the best thing to do is before you go to bed. Some of you, it's going to be in the middle of the day. Uh, some of you, it's on the ride to work with, with a plan and a thing. But I really want to encourage you. And if, if it means baby stepping it, baby step it. What's the first step? Have somebody send me a verse every day. 
or, or get an app that sends me a verse every day and get started in it. But I cannot stress enough the importance of the Word of God. Okay, we have like two minutes left. Uh, anybody think of any other questions? Or comments? Do you have anything written for Truth's Life testimony? Um, I, yes. I didn't put that up there, did I? You know, I really just... Uh, you have basic wisdom, relationships, and character. Yeah, I just put under basic wisdom, you know, things like mind your own business. Um, uh, what's, what's that say? Iron fist paranoid. I don't know what that one means. Okay, uh, relationships, soft answer, things about marriage, uh, getting the whole story, uh, different things like that over Proverbs. And then for character, you know, I put hard work and honesty and humility, you know, different things like that that, Bottom line, just to summarize all three of those, though, is to say the Bible works in life. It gives you the principles that you need uh, to succeed in life and to be, um, you know, a good reflection of him and his glory and to find success in life. You know. Well, I have the books that the Catholics buy. Why were they? Because the debate was, you know, in some of this criteria, they didn't feel like it met the criteria. I'm sorry, I cannot answer you know, specifically while it was taken, I would have to look look up and, and reread it. But uh, it's the Apocrypha. If you Googled, you know, why did the Protestants reject the Apocrypha, you would find the reasons. Uh, I, I can't say this. One thing I do definitely remember is that they felt like some of the ideas in there were inconsistent with the other parts of Scripture. Okay, I, I do remember that and some of that. Uh, a lot of it, however, was very accurate historically. A lot of it was. So it does give us some history of the intertestament period. Uh, because if you're familiar between the Old and New Testament, there's about 400 years. And what happened? Uh, it does give us a lot of that. And most of that is regarded as very historical, historically accurate. Well, doesn't it say in the Bible not that you shouldn't change it? You shouldn't add or subtract to it? Right. That, that's, that's very good. Um, I believe... <laughs> Although I completely agree with that, um, I believe that that particular verse really refers to the one book that it's in you know, when, I, when I really study it. But yes, uh, you know, that is the other question that comes up, up today. I'm sorry, I, let, let me just address that for a second. Um, you will not hear, in, in some denominations, churches, whatever like that, People will claim to have a special word from the Lord. Um, I would caution to be very careful of that because uh, I believe that uh, this is complete. You know, God has given us completely what he wants us to have. Now, you know, I might say, hey, God has impressed upon me to share some money with you. That's a little bit different story. But if I, if I start sharing something especially that contradicts this, you know, you really want to run from it. But yeah, I do think, I'm sorry, we didn't, we didn't really go into that because that's a really good question as to why uh, we're not looking for more. We're not looking for more that this is complete. Um, so you might remember, that verse is in Revelation, right? Um, and I know I have studied that it is, most pe people that I've really dug into it believe that it is specifically talking about the work of Revelation. However, I do think that truth applies to Scripture. You know. Okay, good. <sighs> okay, sorry. Like I said, there will be different teaching styles. So if you're like, eh, 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 uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, uh, Father, thank, uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you for a chance to gather around you. Uh, you. Just talk about you and your word. And Lord, I know I did most of the talking, which is, um, I don't know, probably not the, the, the best there. But I, I still pray that you take uh, and increase our love for your word as a result of the things discussed this evening. I pray in your name. Amen. Uh, we have, I actually have to run and get them, but we have uh, some ice cream. You are welcome to hang around a little bit if you want to sit outside, especially if you have kids that want to hit the uh, playground and, and eat some ice cream. Um, just ice cream and water is what we have, and that will be in the gym. Or you can sneak out, or you can grab the ice cream. In fact, that would be great if you did, uh, even if you're leaving and do it like that. But I'm going to sneak out and go get that out of the freezer because I forgot to ask somebody to do that. So, Okay.